Low River family, thank you so much for joining us again. We're glad that you're here. So we continue this series called Parting Shots, where we see a little bit of the very important things that Jesus said and did uh, between his entrance into Jerusalem and his death and resurrection. So, but we are really glad you're here. No matter where you are, if you need prayer, please feel free to email us any prayer needs that you have. Office at the river Abilene.com. Office at the river Abilene.com. We'd love to be in prayer for you. A few things we want to let you know about April 2nd, if you're watching this in real time, next Sunday, immediately following the service, will be our Team River class. And that's for those who are uh, wanting to know a little bit about the, the history and the doctrine and partnering with uh, this amazing church. We'd love for you to join us immediately following our service next week. Groups are going on. You can go to our groups page on theriverabilene.com and you can at any point join a group. We don't care when. You, you can join at any point. Um, here's a big save the date. April the 29th will be our ladies retreat. It is a magnificent time of ladies coming together and enjoying fellowship and growing further in their relationship with the Lord. Now let's get to what's coming up. Next week, April the 2nd, is Palm Sunday. We have a great time with the kids on Palm Sunday. It's also going to be a family Sunday. It will be a blast. The week after that is Friday. Friday the 7th will be Good Friday. And on Friday the 7th, we will be having a Good Friday service where our drama group will be presenting uh, an amazing, amazing um, uh, skit to help us understand what, what Christ did for us. During that time, our children will start in the sanctuary and then they will go back to the children's building and they will be uh, involved in themselves in a thing called the five senses. And they will be encountering things, kind of engaging with what happened on that day. Then Easter Sunday, we're going to have an amazing time. Easter Sunday, nine o'clock, we're having Rise Up with, with Christ and that is going to be back in the children's building. And so it's for children and their families to join, to go through different stations. And at the very end, they have a big reveal. Uh, it's an amazing time. Then we'll come over at 10 o'clock. We'll be having a great Sunday of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right after that Sunday, we will have a big tent on the grounds and we are going to uh, have a, a lunch for anyone who wants to stay around for lunch. So please know that you are absolutely invited to any of those things. We're excited about celebrating Jesus' resurrection. Also, at any point, no matter where you are, you can participate with what God is doing by giving to God through the river. And there are three different ways that you can do that. You can give by sending a check to 539 U.S. Highway 83, Abilene, Texas 79602, or by secure text at 84321, or you can give by going to the website, theriverabilene.com, theriverabilene.com. Go to the drop down, you can securely give there. Love for you to participate with that. Let's talk about dependence for a minute. What percentage of the U.S. working population believes they will lose their jobs in the next year? Talk amongst yourselves.
we're going to continue to worship, but if you're somebody who has some kiddos you think need you, you're welcome to get them, but we have one more song to worship with you guys if you'd like to stay. Every chain. 
Logan River family, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to continue this journey in uh, hitting these high spots where Jesus uh, gives us a, a picture, uh, a response, a conflict where he's laying down very important things because it's in the final week of his earthly life before his resurrection. So it's the, those few days when he enters Jerusalem until he is resurrected and then eventually ascended. Uh, we learned in the last few weeks that uh, the first time he enters Jerusalem, he's, he's coming in and he's we weeping bitterly. He's wailing because uh, Jerusalem could have peace, could have a holy peace from God Almighty uh, through a holy merger with God's Son. But the people of Israel just don't notice it. And our call is to always see what God's doing in our lives, to be aware of that constantly. Uh, and then we find out that he is he's questioned on authority. And basically, instead of a teaching on authority or, or giving five steps to enacting your authority, he basically shows a submission to authority. And he enacts a full submission to the authority of the Father is how he lives out. It's a concrete presence of God's concrete. And here's what we need to know. We need to know that the more authority given, the more authority is lived. And if we give the Lord more authority in our lives, then we just live out authority, the kind of authority that comes from Jesus Christ naturally. And then we talked about the competition of images uh, that we have, uh, uh, the fact that there was a, a coin given. It was the image of Tiberius. And yet in the juxtaposition of that, everyone there knew that it was a competing image, the image of this world or the image of God Almighty, and that we are created with that divine spark. We are called to reflect the image of God, and we want nothing to compete with that. We don't want to submit to the image of this world, but to the image of God. So let me ask you a question. How, um, how's your dependence on God? How's your dependence on God? to take care of you, to provide for you, to encourage you, to support you, to emotionally hold you up. How dependent are you on God? Shockingly enough, the world has a pretty strong confidence in their job. Only 15% of the workforce actually thinks that they could potentially lose their job in the next year. That's a good confidence. Hope that continues. But where is your source? Where is your trust? Where is your assurance? Where is your true confidence and dependence? 
in back in 1994, there was a 64 year old accountant in London and um, he had a pretty strong distrust of doctors and hospitals and nurses. Um, he had kind of a fear and a phobia and he just didn't feel like he could trust them. Well, it turned out that he needed a, a relatively minor bladder surgery, a fairly quick surgery, but he just could not depend on the medical group. He just couldn't trust them. So he decided he would do the surgery on himself for himself. After his surgery, semi-successful surgery, he developed an infection and within a few days was gone because he didn't trust doctors, nurses, or hospitals. When we lose the sourcing of who we are really supposed to trust to depend on, it brings a slow death to us. In this parting shot, we're going to see what many people would think about giving is maybe something different. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, thank you for uh, your word. I thank you that this moment that we're about to read is um, gut-wrenching. It's difficult. Contextually, it's hard to conceive of. But Lord, I pray in the next few moments that we would learn to have a real, real sense of our source. And Lord, as for me, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and you be our preacher and teacher today. And all people said, amen. I hope you said amen. If you have a Bible, I want you to go to Luke chapter 20, and I'm going to be starting in verse 45. Now we're going to slide right into the first four verses of the next chapter. Please know verses, chapters, all those identifications, headings that are above certain texts, all artificial. So I want you to see it as we read it as one passage, as one thought pattern is one encounter so that it will all kind of make sense. So let's look in verse 45 of Luke chapter 20. Now he's had multiple uh, uh, conflicts with the, the Pharisees and the scribes, these teachers. So this has gone on multiple times. Um, it's getting a little hot. They're not really thrilled with him. And he's back in the temple. And, and that's where we find him at this point. While all the people were listening to Jesus, he said this to his disciples. Now, here's what's interesting. The reason that Luke puts us in here while all the people were listening, he's basically saying um, Jesus is about to make a statement to those who are listening, which means those who are the religious leaders that want him dead are also listening. He's already... Uh, kind of given some scathing rebuke of them. He's already uh, implanted them in a parable or two where they're the main character and it's been uh, kind of scathing. And now he's, he's sort of elevating his voice because he wants to say something that they will hear. Verse 46, Beware of the teachers of the law. That's right in your face. They like to walk around in flowing robes. No, I think this is kind of funny. So um, it, it's kind of like uh, for the gym rats who show up in their new Lululemon. Or kick back another generation, the, the pink eyes odd and leg warmers. It depends on what generation you're from. Or the tie-dye shirt. You see, it's that look at me thing. I am important. And this flowing robe is a way of, with a little bit of a kicker of religiosity and faith, look at me. It's a scathing rebuke. They like to walk around in flowing robes 
and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. You know, it's kind of like they're at the grocery store and all of a sudden, hey, Johnny, come here. I want you to meet Bob. He's a great man of God. Look at his robe. He's a great man of God. This is a very in-your-face parting shot. I love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogue in the places of honor at banquets. You see, in the synagogue, if you weren't uh, leading the synagogue or part of it, the, the important people got certain seats. Sometimes that's happened in the church of Jesus Christ as well. And then banquets, the closer you are to the host, the more important you are. So that means a seat somewhere near the host. They love this. They love this. Then he begins to really unpack something that I'm going to help you understand a little more about in just a bit. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished literally Punished most severely, literally judged most severely. Now, you might say, what does that have to do with what happens next? Has everything to do with what happens next? Because you have a widow in this passage, a widow whose house is being devoured, and then you're going to have a widow in the next passage. So it's kind of important. So stick with me on how these things are linked. As Jesus looked up, He saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. So think of this as one conversation. Jesus looks up. That means he's probably sitting. And that means he's probably in the women's uh, uh, court and one of the uh, enclosed parts of the portico where they would give to the temple. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. Uh, We find in in the, uh, the Mishnah that there was one of these that had 13 shofar, shaped or trumpet shaped giving receptacles and that meant that that the top of it looked like a trumpet or a shofar and then uh, the bottom part would sort of widen out to receive all the offerings and what would happen is people would come up and they would lay these offerings in there but it was sort of supervised by the priests the priests were there in an observation role and people would come up and they would make a declaration before they dropped it in Here's $25 for the wood for the sacrifices. They would drop it in. Here's $50 to take care of the gold in the temple to make sure it's clean. Drop it in. Here's $100 for incense in the temple. And they would drop it. So they'd verbally make the declaration that they're giving to the worship of Jehovah, that they care deeply about Jehovah. That's what the offering was supposed to symbolize. And then they would drop it into those receptacles. Now, the priests are taking note of this um, because they want to take note of who gives large amounts, and the priests are pretty corrupt. Uh, there's a lot of that money that somehow ends up in their pockets. We'll talk a little bit more about that, about that in a bit. So this is an ostentatious display. Jesus watches it, and these people are giving... If they got $1,000, they're giving one. They're giving out of their excess. Now watch what happens. He also saw a poor widow. Now, widow shows back up. Put in two very small copper coins. Now, we find out from other passages, like uh, passages, that these are called leptin. Uh, Leptin means one thin piece. (laughs) It is... The shavings, the copper shavings, it's the leftover shavings from making the real money. And they would stamp it, and it was worth, I want you to hear this, one 128th of a day's wage. So a common worker who would work a day, about 10 hours in a work day, a common worker would earn one of these every four minutes. It is a very small denomination of money. She is putting in two of these, which means she's giving one sixty-fourths of a day's wages. Aren't you with me? Now watch what happens. And she's a widow. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow, there it is again, has put in more than all the others. The disciples are probably like, well, yeah, 
that's like she barely put anything in. They all put in big money. Now what's what he says. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now, this passage is um, lifted up many times by pastors to talk about sacrificial giving. And she clearly is sacrificially giving. But there's a clue in that final phrase there whenever it says that she put in all she had to live on. And so I believe Jesus, first of all, has a really soft spot for those who are very vulnerable. You see, uh, widows in this particular society, they don't have any uh, social standing. Uh, they can't really do business. And so consequently what happens is, is they end up being the very poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable of society, which is why the scripture all throughout the Old Testament is saying, take care of the widows, take care of the orphans. And to not do that is a severe violation of the heart of God Almighty. God loves the vulnerably dependent people who are vulnerably dependent on Him. Did you hear that? We live in a world that extols the virtue of those who are self-made, the winners in life the people who stepped on others to get to the top. The ones have a, a, a very um, compelling story. Rarely will you find a book where someone who has lived a life of radical dependence on God. Those are harder to come by. So I would contend that Jesus especially from what we see in this passage, especially knowing what a widow goes through, is not just extolling the virtues of sacrificially giving. He is elevating the picture of radical dependence on the divine. A radical dependence on God Almighty. Not just that she gave, that she's deeply, profoundly connected to God. Now, beloved, I think that this message is incredibly important to us right now. Incredibly important to us. Crazy economy, uh, a lot of unrest in the world, uh, lots of churches faltering and going down. There's lots of reasons to feel insecure right now. But I believe there's a few things that we can garner from this that will help us understand a, an amazing, amazing lifestyle of radical dependence on God. Let me give you a couple of things to think about. First is this. He is lifting up her, the widow's, profound understanding of sourcing. Let me say it again. He's lifting up this widow's profound understanding of sourcing. You see, um, everybody else gave a little bit of their big pile. She gave all of her little pile. Which meant the minute those two coins dropped into that shofar-shaped receptacle... She had nothing she could point to to provide for her needs. Nothing. Nothing to provide for her needs. She has fallen into a full-blown forced dependence. And when we move into this, there's a couple of different things we have to think about. We, we need to understand, like she did, that sometimes there are things in our lives that need to be eliminated so that the, we don't elevate them to our source, our provision. 
You see, when she dropped those coins in, she couldn't point to those two coins on her table and said, well, I might get a piece of bread with that. She couldn't do it anymore. When she dropped them into the offering plate, that was eliminated. And she had nothing else that she could depend on. You know, it reminds me that many of us don't find a true dependence on God until it's all gone. Until the person that emotionally supports us is gone. Until the bank account is empty. Until our job is gone. uh, Until a friendship is broken. uh, Until a church falters. We struggle to truly be in the place where we know the source because we have multiple threads of sources that we hold on to. Some of those sources, beloved, need to be eliminated. She had nobody to turn to. Drop, drop. And her source was gone. And her source moved. It reminds me of uh, of surgery. I remember uh, the first surgery I had laying on my back in pain, preparing to go into surgery and a surgeon coming in and saying, we're going to put you to sleep. (laughs) We're going to cut you open. We're going to cut something out and then you're going to wake up. I got no control. I got no other source, but to believe that that guy can take care of me. And then I got no other source, but to believe that there's a God behind him that's even bigger. This widow understood what it meant to become fully dependent that there was nothing left, no thread of dependence. Secondly, we need to eliminate those things in our lives that that we can point to, that we can depend on. Those things that God calls us to get rid of and then those things that are right that we depend on, we need to understand that they all come from a single source. A single source. We need to live in constant awareness that the meeting of all of our needs comes from a single source. You see what happened when she dropped those coins in there? It was a transference. She transferred dependence from those two coins to the God that she was giving to. Can I say that again? She transferred the dependence on those two coins over to the God when she gave them away, over to God, the God that she really needed to depend on. There's one source, beloved. There's one source in your life. If you've said yes to Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of God Almighty, there's one source. One. And if we don't recognize it, then that source will slide into the position of God and our dependence will slide into the position of trusting those things instead of trusting the true source with a capital S, God Almighty. I believe that my wife supports me, but God gave her to me. He's the source. I have a salary from this church, but God put me and this church together. He's the source. I believe in the family that raised me up, fed me, nurtured, and encouraged me, but God gave me to them and them to me. He's the source. You see, things that we've allowed to become God should be eliminated. And the other things that we need that are going to keep us in ministry, we desperately need to always be aware that the source is singular. It is God Almighty. Not the thing He's provided, but God. There's just a simple, simple thing. When we pause and take a breath, And as a group, as a family, even alone, thank 
God for the meal he's provided. It's a way of saying, I know my job didn't provide this. I know my spouse's job didn't provide this. I know uh, that, that other people gave this to me, didn't provide this, that this came specifically from God. This widow realized when she gave those things away, it was a shifting of dependence, not on those two coins, but on God Almighty. Do you pause often? Do you think about the things that get you by, the things that feed you, the things that support you, the things that walk with you emotionally, that they are gifts from the source? They are not the source. And if the removal of any one of those things through something difficult or something tragic is definitely frightening to you, then guess what? You need to one-up your understanding of sourcing. It comes from God. They come from God. It's a transference. Now let me speak to something very culturally relevant to us. So first, we need to, he, he's lifting up her profound understanding of sourcing. And then we need to eliminate things that we've allowed to become God, sources that are allowed to become God. And then we need to live in constant awareness that everything that provides for our needs is from a singular source, and that is God Almighty. Now listen to this. Number two, radical dependence um, is not dependent on fairness or justice in this realm. Let me, let me say it again. I'll unpack it. Radical dependence on God is not dependent on fairness or justice in this realm. Let me tell you what the widow faced that maybe you don't know. So what would happen is when a woman lost her husband and she became a widow, uh, she had no real economic standing or the ability to do business. Uh, she didn't have the ability necessarily in this part of Palestine to have a job. She became fully dependent either on other family members many times because of what's going on. They are dead or they don't live there anymore. And so these women would become deeply dependent on the temple. That's the center of life. And what would happen is, is a, a, a widow would, would send a message to the priest. My husband has passed. I need a trustee. And what would happen is the, pre, the, the priest would select five or ten people and they would go over to her house. I want you to see how this first part of the passage is important. And they would um, sort of vie for being the trustee. And they would come in flowing robes with status and they would make pious prayers in front of her for her as she chose to pick a trustee who would do business on her behalf to sustain her. Now what happened? Why did Jesus say devour widow's houses? Here's what they would do. So whoever became the trustee would winnow their way in to the point that this widow, who's probably generally older, would eventually say that the house, when she's gone, would go to that trustee, that Pharisee. Or they would over-temple tax her to the point where her liability is beyond what she could handle, and then they would take the house as um, a way of payment for what she owed. And consequently, they would do irreparable harm to a poor widow and they would take her home. Didn't go down to family. It wasn't sold. It became the property of a Pharisee. The very thing, listen, the very thing that the temple is supposed to do to protect the most vulnerable of society, the very thing that is scriptural, that is mandated all the way through, is the very thing that they went opposite with 
and they ended up absolutely terrorizing through through religious means they ended up terrorizing and truly making these poor widows fully destitute what a horrible thing and yet and yet beloved she still walked in there she declared her offering so that the worship of God can continue and she dropped in those two leptin those two little bitty thin pieces of, of coinage she did that knowing that the next step was a corrupt priesthood who will mismanage those funds a group of religious zealots who will eventually probably take her property and this will just expedite the process but she still gave knowing that everything that happened after that gift in the human realm and even in the faith realm would not be just or fair. You see, dependence on God is not dependent on whether or not we are treated fairly or our dependence on God is seen as profound or wonderful or right. Beloved, we have a tendency in our world to attach to the faith community some injustice, some unfairness, and it slides us from depending on God to the point that we no longer trust God. Recent uh, Billy Graham group uh, survey detailed that of um, U.S. adults who used to be churched, who have become unchurched, one third of them have left the church and have not gone back because of what they deem an ugly situation that caused them hurt and that caused them to no longer trust church or God. It was a wrecking of dependence she's facing this very thing by the people who are supposed to take care of her and yet she still gives because her source is not fairness or justice her source is god almighty you with me it's not dependent on that it's dependent on god so beloved have, have you come to a place where you realize there's some things in your life that you have developed an undue trust, an undue dependence on? They're not God. Well, you can either eliminate them or if they're sustaining you, you can recognize that there's only one source. There may be multiple streams of you being taken care of, but there's only one source. It's God Almighty. And beloved, we can never use the excuse that there is some injustice, some unfairness through the church, people of faith, someone on TV. We can't do that and allow it to keep us from really a true dependence on God Almighty. So my question to you is, in this parting shot, will you develop a profound, profound dependence on God? Or will you allow other things to keep you from the most fruitful, most powerful, most fulfilling relationship you could ever have. That is a relationship of full dependence on God.
That is the stuff of life. Lord, I, um, I ask that you would look in the depths of our heart, Lord. There's things that we trust in, Lord. There's things that we have dependence on. Lord, for those things that are not vital to who we are called to be and to do, I pray, Lord, that we'd be willing to eliminate them. And then, Lord, for those things that are vital to allow us to be who we are called to be and, and allow us to do what we're called to do, Lord, I pray that we would see that they come from a single source and never allow those things that sustain us to become our God, but only our God to be our source. And then, Lord, I pray we'd never use the excuse of hurt or injustice or unfairness to keep us from a maximum dependence on you. Lord, I pray that there be some freedom right now in people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Bank account, job, friendship, parents, house, inheritance. There may be a lot of things where we've slid our dependence. I pray that you allow them to be challenged, eliminated, or redefined as a stream from the source. And that without excuse, no matter what happens in this realm, we would never, ever cease to depend on our God. We'll see you next week.